dear. You're asleep right now, so I thought I'd do another little chunk of the, uh, Kadui invasion of Wraith last year. I'd almost stopped believing in miracles. This medicine chest. It's greater than the serums and salves it holds. It tells us that we can do more in Ray class than merely suffer. I've not much to offer in return, but please, take something and thanks for what you've done. I let go of baths. This elemental prolifer proliferation might be handy. I usually do a fire mage when I'm uh, being a slacker here. And let's sell off some things that I'm not actually going to use. Might as well do a staff for them. I'll be switching to Firestorm as soon as I get it. It's going to be a quest reward. So it should be coming up before too terribly long. I know it happens in this act, but it's always later that I think it's going to Goodbye. Be. But AoE is always a nice thing to have. You know, why do I have remove only tabs in here? I am using the right... Character, right? Why are you in standard lane? Oh well, we can work with that. It does mean I'm an idiot and we won't be having some of the uh, brand new stuff. Maybe I'll change that later, but um, probably just as well because there's honestly no chance that I'm actually going to get through streaming this all to you before the league ends. Although gosh, I play, I play through a lot of leagues, I have a lot of stash tabs, I should clean that up at some point. So here we have the passive tree, it is a very big. The only difference is where you started it. That's what all of these little dealies are. But as a witch, um, I'm just going to bump my spell damage for right now. So, you managed to salvage Shaky Ann's druggery. Nicely done. Nessa will put it to good use. More than that benumbed quack Optin never did. Yeah, I guess he was a junkie, huh? Interesting that they say opiates and not, like, laudanum or something like that. But it's still opiates, it's not some fantasy variant. Got a job for you, if you're willing. There's a pool near the mud flats needs investigating. You'll smell it before you see it. Stinks like a carcass in high summer, but that's not the worst of it. Dead birds walking. Animals don't rise up again the same as people do here. So if they aren't raising themselves, what's doing it for them? The answer's in that fetid pool. Clear the place out and kill whatever's raising those rowers. We've got enough living dead to contend with already. So that's interesting on a metaphysical level because it does imply that the raising of humans is some kind of it's specific to humans, so specific to their sins, specific to something magical about them. We do see other sorts of undead things occasionally, but it's almost always humans. And the wildlife becomes unfriendly and murderous, much more than it used to be in times before the apocalypse here, but 
I'm not sure we ever quite get an explanation for this, other than mad science and hubris are problematic. Though they might look like you or I, behind those eyes there's nothing but darkness and hunger. Whatever's got inside those folks is not even close to being human. Yeah, so this is probably tying back into those spirits that you end up seeing come out of the cannibals when you kill them. Um, they seem to be possessed, never quite explained. That medicine chest you found, it'll do more than you might think. The medicine will run out, it always does, but Nessa won't. Give that girl a sliver of hope and she'll carry it to the end of the world. Stay sharp out there. Tarkley totally has a thing for Nessa, by the way. Which, uh, unlikely to end well in this, uh, crap sack world. But still. Let's keep going. So here we have another of these, uh, Obviously, Kadui gateways here. Remnants of the invasion. I think they were added in a patch some time ago. I don't think they were original when I started playing. And here we have our first real look at Roas. You do see some of them. You see one strung up for food in camp. They're basically being eaten like chicken. But, uh, I think they are something like a cassowary, perhaps? Um, we'll see various types of them, and they seem to be some kind of natural wildlife that's just become more murderous with, uh, the apocalypse and becoming feral and all of that. Not sapient, not particularly intelligent, but always been around. I think this ray class will serve. Still love the way. So here we can see a little stream. Perhaps this is some kind of floodplain. I think that would make a lot of sense for why it's uh, always seems to be muddy. We do have all of these insects here and frogs, which would kind of support the idea that this is ephemeral pools. These look like mangroves or something similar. Uh, and I know those are evolved to deal with occasional flooding, so. I think what we're walking on here is some kind of floodplain. And presumably we're just out of season, which I think the implication so far has been that we're probably in summer, so that probably makes sense. Because it's probably the uh, seasonal rainfall that causes it to properly flood, and we're right at the end of that right now. Here we've got more of these Kadoi longhouses. It's interesting that the dead pop out of the ground in a very uh, disturbing way, but we never sink into the mud even a little bit. And I know that that is a possibility because there's an effect later in the game where you are partially buried, so... Perhaps, uh, bury burrowing into the ground is a uh, magical aspect of these undead based on how they died. The frogs are cute too. So here we have the fetid pool. This area is going to come back in Act 6. You can see that the gateway here is much more ornate than most of them and it's also got the uh, spikes that I think we've come to recognize as defensive structures in this area from Lion Eyes Watch. I hope we've got the fetid pool. All of this mist doesn't have a mechanical effect, but it's spooky, ain't it? And this seems like a much larger and more elaborate longhouse than we've seen, too. These little guys are a cursed spawn. 
we're going to be seeing more of them as the act proceeds too, but they're basically um, squid-like monsters. More dates on the lore there a little later on. And we've got more of these trees that do definitely look like mangroves going in, so this is probably another seasonally flooded area, I think. And I mean, ephemeral pools are breeding grounds for insect life, but it's also clearly, you know, magic bullshit. Here we've got our first necromancer. I think that it is a... Yeah, we've got a little flag doctor thing going on here. They're never flagged as undead, which suggests that they may be living people who've given themselves up to a terrible dark power here. It's never really explained, but the fact that they're not flagged as undead has always seemed uh, concerning to me. It might also just be for mechanical reasons so that they can't raise each other, but Cadaverous the Defiler is also a spooky name. It seems like the kind of edgelord name that someone who's uh, on the edge of losing their brain would give themselves, honestly. And we do see a lot of people who lose themselves either to causes or to the uh, magic that they've used to give themselves power or to their ideology. It, it's all pretty thematic. And obviously the bone row are those same uh, cassowary-ish animals that we've seen elsewhere. Mr. Nugget is screaming because he is very upset that I am hanging out with Spare for a few minutes. But I think he'll manage. Ah, yeah. And once we kill all of the animals, or all of the undead rather, all of the monsters, you can see this area loses that green effect. There's still that mist on the ground, but it looks much more similar to the mud flats. Um, and yeah, I think this is clearly an area of ephemeral pools. This looks like moss, honestly. Maybe algae. That's definitely moss or something similar here. Not quite enough texture on it for me to really see it great, but... Floodplain area. Which suggests that there is, uh, probably a river that overflows. Hint, hint. Yeah, that's gonna come up in just a couple minutes here. Black storms descend on us from the north. Unnatural tempests of rage and hatred, lashing our backs, tearing at our houses. The rain is shot with shadow. It withers our crops, sickens our livestock. And the wind, the wind carries with it a restless spirit that breeds melancholy and madness. A spirit that creeps through our dreams, weaves tales of misdeed around our resting minds. We try not to listen. We try to remember ourselves. Some of us forget. Brothers fight. Brothers die. Calm punishes those that quarrel, that steal, that murder. Yet still the nightmares goad us into malefaction. We, Kadui, are banished from sleep. So this is when the Kadui invasion starts going really wrong. And we see this in some other areas, that there's storms that uh, drive people crazy, that there's weather effects associated with madness and dark magic, and people become 
possessed or become darker versions of themselves. I think it would also make a lot of sense if the Roa are actually feral Kadui livestock. I don't think it's ever actually discussed what their livestock are, but clearly the Roa are quite edible. Parkley mentions hunting them regularly. And while they're not the best livestock to eat, that's certainly a matter of taste. So I think these guys are feral food animals, actually. I think that would make a lot of sense. I would say maybe also riding animals, but I don't think they're really big enough for it. Um, where the storm that drives people crazy comes from is never quite explained. Uh, the Kadui invasion occurred before the actual fall of Sarn by several decades, I think. So it's not the effect of the most recent apocalypse. I think it's probably implied that this is part of the ongoing cycle of madness and destruction that tends to occur in Rayclast. Um, it might be the I don't know. Might be the influence of magic. Um, I would say the influence of a god, but at this time, all of the gods would have been asleep. So, more deeds on all of that later, obviously. We're also no longer seeing things washed up on shore, I believe, so. We are a little bit away from the ocean, which makes sense because if we were close to the ocean we would expect to see less wildlife even without the sand because of all of the salt getting into the soil. So here we have some nests, very big eggies, I think that does support the idea that they're um, livestock. I mean they could just be big eggs, but like... People eat ostriches, people eat emus, even though they're murderous monstrosities of destruction. And there's three of these lovely lit glyphs. Um, the Halitosis glyph, or Haliotis glyph. Its corrugated surface brings a strange tingle to the fingertips. This is no mere decoration. The Ammonite glyph. When put to the air, it whispers, not of the sea, but long dead incantations. And the rosiest glyph. Its pleasing sheen remains even in shadow, as if it were somehow lit from within. The origin of these glyphs is never explained. I don't think it is Kadui um, magic, because I'm not sure we ever see the Kadui using that kind of... Um, spoken magic. So, I would think that the probable origin, if it's anywhere within that time frame, is the uh, Sarnish defenders trying to block off parts of their uh, territory. Yeah, so this this wiggly effect, that's actually causing me damage over time. Which is part of why the green on the ground in the fetid pool was particularly concerning, because it does have a very close visual similarity there. Um, but yeah, possibly these glyphs are the remnants of a attempt to defend the uh, Sarnish territory from the Kadui invaders by blocking it off. And here we go. I love when you can just see bits of Highland that you never actually get to go to, by the way. Look at this lovely, uh, lovely plant life. All of these ferns and pretty trees. Although that that's very brown. And I don't think it's just a lighting effect, so presumably, especially twisted as it is and kind of falling over. The ferns seem happy, but maybe there is something dark and twisted in the soil that's causing problems. But anyway, here we go. The glyphs, of course, go into the glyph wall. And you can see over here, there's a uh, 
bunch of streams that are converging on this little uh, grotto, which leads into an underground river, probably into the uh, local groundwater reservoir. So when we click there, the submerged passage is now open. And there's enough space for us to uh, wander inside. Got another waypoint here. And you can see this is a pretty elaborate cave structure. Um, clearly there have been people here before, but not in quite some time by these bridges. We never do see things that are completely ruined and cut off in this area, I think, so presumably it's been used. And I think that seems fairly consistent with uh, being constructed by the Sarnish defenders rather than someone long before or just random villagers who had to pass through here. So we don't really see um, the kind of remnants we would expect if this were just a regular passageway that people took. So I'm going to go with the theory that this is this was a uh, blocked off by the Sarnish defenders in order to try and defend their territory. We're seeing a lot of these uh, skeletons, a lot of tentacle monsters, a lot of crabs. I'm gonna call these guys crabs even though that's probably a questionable taxonomy. taxonomy. But um, since we've just hit a waypoint, let's call it here for right now and I'll stop Mr. Nugget from screaming eternally.